Good evening, and thank you for joining us tonight for Pediatric Onset Multiple Sclerosis, Unique Features and Considerations. This webinar series is brought to you by Can Do Multiple Sclerosis, the National Multiple Sclerosis Society, and the Multiple Sclerosis Society of Canada. My name is Laura Allen, Programs Manager for Can Do MS, and I will be your moderator this evening. Can Do MS delivers health and wellness education programs to help families with MS thrive. Please visit the Can Do MS website, kendu-ms.org, to learn more about Can Do MS's online and nationwide in-person programs. The mission of the National MS Society is to help people affected by MS live their best lives as they stop MS in its tracks, restore what has been lost, and end MS forever. You can explore other societies' programs, services, resource, and connection opportunities at nationalmssociety.org. Our speakers this evening are Anusha Ishokumar, MD, and James Tomowski, PhD. Anusha is an autoimmune neurologist who cares for patients with multiple sclerosis and other autoimmune diseases that affect the central nervous system in children and adults. She joined the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in 2017. She received her undergraduate deg degree from Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, where she majored in neuroscience. And she obtained her MD degree from Jefferson Medical College in Philadelphia. James is an associate professor of neurology at Mount Sinai and the clinical neuropsychologist at the Corinne Gold, Goldsmith Dixon Center for Multiple Sclerosis. Jim is an expert on cognition in persons with MS. And now I would like to turn the program over to Anusha. Great, thank you. Um, so I just took off through our uh, learning objectives for the evening. I, I wanted to review uh, pediatric onset MS who gets it, how common is it, and what do the symptoms in the disease course look like? We'll also talk about some of the considerations um, when selecting a disease-modifying therapy, as well as symptomatic treatment. Um, and then I'll turn it over to Jim to talk about some of the special considerations in this population, including academic and social challenges, as well as some strategies for wellness and support. Um, and then we'll turn it back to Laura to go over some of the resources um, uh, that, that are available for, for patients and their families. All right, so pediatric onset MS uh, is typically defined as uh, uh, patients who have an onset of symptoms prior to the age of 18 years. And really we found re in, in recent studies that um, pediatric onset MS is the most common cause of non-traumatic neurologic disability in young adults. Um, while we well, we know that an estimated 2.3 to 2.5 million people um, are living with MS worldwide, uh, we estimate that about 2,000 to 4,000 cases uh, of diagnosed pediatric onset MS exist worldwide. However, if you dig into the numbers a little further, um, it turns out that up to 10% of adults with MS recall having initial symptoms prior to the age of 18 years, even if they hadn't received a formal diagnosis at that point. So the, the MS disease course in children is essentially exclusively one of a relapsing, remitting uh, nature. So we don't see the, the other forms of MS um, in our children and adolescents. And what you can see in this graph is that uh, patients will have sort of clinical episodes uh, or relapses, as we call them, and then sort of a remission of symptoms or an improvement of symptoms um, until the next relapse um, in, in cases where there are additional relapses. Um, often the MRI will show um, uh, changes um, <clears throat> and new lesions with these clinical episodes, but as similar to what can be seen in adults, you can also have MRI changes in the absence of any clinical symptoms. And really at this point early in the first 10 years or so of diagnosis, we think that these uh, lesions and relapses are occurring because of peripherally initiated inflammatory injury, meaning something that's happening in the autoimmune system throughout the body that's then causing inflammation in the brain and the spinal cord. So as a neurologist, I get asked a lot how pediatric onset MS is different from adult onset 
And I do think there are some specific features that are important to note. So first of all, we see a high burden of lesions on an MRI, even when children and adolescents are otherwise looking relatively healthy and normal on neurologic exam. We'll talk a little bit more about this um, in the coming slides. Uh, we also know that children and adolescents typically have more frequent relapses than adults, um, especially in their first year after diagnosis. And with more relapses, that means there's less time between each relapse. Um, of course, with this being, you know, children and adolescents, there are unique treatment considerations to keep in mind. Um, and we try to time things around, for example, the school year and holidays and, um, you know, other events that may be going on uh, in, a, in a high school student's life, for example, and we'll discuss some of these. And then I think there's uh, recently been a lot of attention to the fact that cognition can be affected, even if subtly, um, but significantly, in the absence of any physical disability. So now I want to go through some of the uh, important things to note with age, sex, and clinical presentations of pediatric onset MS. So here you can see in a, in a large study from 2013, the distribution of age of onset uh, of patients with pediatric onset MS. And what you see is that the overwhelming majority of these patients really are having symptom onset after the age of 10, um, really more so after the age of 12. So this implies to us that puberty probably plays some role and there may be some hormonal uh, involvement as well that leads us to see this more commonly um, in, in older adolescents. Uh, so really, in, in general, uh, pediatric onset MS before the age of 10 is quite rare, although we do see it. Uh, something else that sort of suggests that hormones and, and puberty play a role is looking at how uh, the uh, sex changes, um, or the predominance of, of uh, males versus females changes at different age groups. So when we look at overall at our pediatric onset cohort, uh, what we see is that women, uh, girls and women are about two times as likely as boys or men to have pediatric onset MS. Um, but this is really driven by this older group of, of patients who are more than 10 years old. So in fact, if you look at patients under 10 years old, it's much more likely that boys and girls are affected to the same degree. And in fact, if you look at the really younger kids under the age of six, there's some studies that show that boys are more likely to have pediatric onset MS than girls. And again, what this suggests to us is that, um, you know, as, as uh, children go through puberty, um, we're more likely to see this in girls than in boys, suggesting that hormones play a role in the development of pediatric onset MS. There are a few different common clinical presentations that we see uh, patients present with, and I'm, I'll go through these in more detail. These include optic neuritis, transverse myelitis, a brainstem syndrome, and something called acute disseminated encephalomyelitis, which although rare, we do see more in children and adolescents than in adults, so I think is worth um, putting a little attention into. So optic neuritis uh, presents with a rapid onset of visual loss. There may be pain with eye movements as well. Uh, and <clears throat> when patients are seen by neurologists, the neurologist will note that they have reduced vision. Um, they can have abnormal blind spots. So as you can see in this top picture, patients may see a black spot over their central portion of their vision. Uh, there may be a loss of red color vision. So when patients look at uh, red objects in particular, they feel like they're not as bright, not as red looking out of that eye compared to the other eye. Um, and then you can see optic disc swelling as well. And you can see this both on neurologic exam, but also on an MRI that uh, looks specifically at the optic nerves in the eyes. The next common clinical presentation that we see is transverse myelitis. So for this, patients will present with numbness and tingling or weakness in one of their arms and legs. Uh, they may have something called a Lermit sign, which is described uh, by patients by when they move their neck from side to side or up and down, they may feel an electrical zap down their spine. And they may also have problems with uh, urinary and bowel dysfunction. Um, on exam, we see motor deficits in, in the affected uh, extremity. We can see sensory loss as well. We might see something called a sensory level, which means below a certain point in the back, um, there's a, a significant change in, in the sensation or the feeling that the patient may have. Um, and when we look at reflexes, they may be asymmetric from left to right or from the arms to the legs. 
And again, we use MRI here to look for lesions or spots in the spinal cord that correspond with the symptoms that patients are experiencing. A brainstem syndrome, so this affects the back of the brain that connects the, the brain to the spinal cord itself. Uh, and patients can present either with cranial nerve dysfunction, so their eyes are not moving normally, their face is, has lost sensation in some way, there may be dizziness, uh, or patients may have problems um, in the part of the brain called the cerebellum, uh, which can lead to problems with coordination and balance. And again, we'll see corresponding uh, lesions on imaging that, that go along with the symptoms that patients are having. And finally, as I mentioned, this is a rare syndrome, but it is something that we see in children uh, who develop MS, much more so than we see in adults. And this is something called acute disseminated encephalomyelitis, or ADEM for short. And on exam here, and in terms of symptoms, patients can present with something called encephalopathy, where they have an alteration of mental status, they may be very lethargic, they may have seizures, um, or they may have neurologic deficits in multiple areas uh, of the body that have corresponding um, lesions on the MRI and then corresponding exam findings as well. And again, the MRI can show these abnormal lesions um, that can help us to make a diagnosis. So there have been a lot of studies, particularly recently, looking at different genetic as well as different environmental risk factors for the development of pediatric onset MS. And what we know is that compared to uh, the general population, the incidence of MS does go up in patients who have a first degree relative with MS or who have uh, an identical twin who has MS. Um, but this being said, I think that the take home point here is that while the, the increase in the incidence of MS is statistically higher, really the chances still are quite low um, that just if somebody who has a family member with MS is going to have MS themselves. And I think that's something to just keep in mind and, and be reassured about. Um, and then we've done a lot of studies trying to figure out which markers uh, from the genetics are associated with the development of this. And the most consistent allele is something called HLA-DR1501. In terms of environmental risk factors, uh, some of the things that have been focused on are vitamin D, the Epstein-Barr virus, obesity, and cigarette smoking. And I'll go into these in a little more detail as well. So large studies looking at um, children with pediatric onset MS have found that they typically have a, an average vitamin D level of 53.4, which initially when we look at that number on average, again, does not appear very low. We like to keep our vitamin D levels above 50 in, in patients with neurologic disease. But when you look at how this number changes from people with MS to people who have um, a one-time clinical event but never go on to have another problem, you see that the, the children and adolescents with MS have this, again, this vitamin D level around 52, but it's much higher around 66.2 in this study uh, of patients who have a one-time episode and, and never have um, uh, another episode uh, of uh, MS. And then as I mentioned, there's been a lot of attention to Epstein-Barr virus too. So this is a virus that's in the herpes group of viruses, but is not a herpes virus per se. Um, and it's very common that by the time people reach adulthood, that they've had been exposed to this. So about 90% of our adults have been exposed to this virus at some point in their life. Um, it's typically an asymptomatic virus in young children. Um, and you may have heard of this as something called infectious mononucleosis, or mono for short, um, uh, occurring when people get this in their sort of later childhood or adolescence. So studies have shown that uh, you can see here on the left with EBV, that while uh, patients with children and, and adolescents with pediatric onset MS um, have an over 80% chance of having been exposed to this virus in the past. This percentage is only about half of that in children and adolescents um, who've had a one-time presentation but do not go on to develop MS. Um, and this is really the case for Epstein-Barr virus, but not the case for other viruses that have been looked at. 
Uh, so now I'll go through um, some of how we get to making a diagnosis of pediatric onset MS, and then also how the disease course itself differs between children and adults. So in 2017, uh, there were new criteria that came out called the McDonald criteria for MS. And this was a follow-up to uh, criteria that had been published several years before that. And now we have a better sense of how these criteria apply to children. So what we've seen is that this, these new criteria enable us to have an improved diagnostic accuracy across the age span. So where prior criteria had been much better for adults than children, um, these criteria now are much better for children and adolescents. And I, we think that this is because of the inclusion of uh, cerebrospinal fluid um, as one of the uh, diagnostic criteria. Uh, which really can allow, uh, enable us to get to a diagnosis sooner for patients. And what we've seen is that these criteria are more sensitive, but less specific. And so what this means is that we are more likely to capture and make an accurate diagnosis early on, but sometimes um, the, these diagnoses can overcall um, cases uh, for children and adolescents. And as I mentioned, as compared to the prior criteria, these this new criteria are much better for the use uh, in children less than 12 years of age. Uh, in terms of the differences in MRI and uh, clinical course as well, we see that, as I mentioned earlier, there's a much higher uh, lesion burden on MRI in children and adolescents as compared to adults. So we see overall a greater number of lesions total, uh, a greater number of lesions that enhance with contrast, with gadolinium contrast, uh, and a higher number of uh, lesions in the back of the brain. And I'll show you some pictures of that in a minute. So here is a sort of typical looking MRI for a, a child or an adolescent with uh, pediatric onset MS. Um, and again, these lesions tend to be larger and they tend to be more numerous than what we might see in an, in an adult. And then again, uh, more lesions in the back of the brain in that, in that brainstem area, which we also call the posterior fossa. So you can see this picture shows uh, a superimposition of multiple patients with MS, uh, both children and adults. And you can see that there are quite a bit no more lesions in the children with MS as compared to in the adults in that part of the brain. We've also found higher relapse rates in pediatric MS. So uh, most notably in the first year or so from the initial diagnosis or the initial clinical episode, but even extending beyond that point, uh, we, there is concern that children will just have more clinical relapses and need to be watched more closely. So as I alluded to, there's specific treatment considerations that myself as a neurologist thinks about when I'm seeing a child or an adolescent with pediatric onset MS. And I think these factors need to be taken into consideration as we think about choosing the right disease-modifying therapy, as well as talking to uh, our children and adolescents about the need for these medications. So I think a lot about injections and what the frequency of injections might be and what the size of the needle will be. I also think a lot about the blood work that's involved for each medication and how frequent that will be and how bothersome this is going to be for the patient. Uh, and then certainly side effects are something else that we take into account. And this particularly for me is an, is an area I focus on because uh, when starting a, a child or an adolescent with pediatric onset MS on disease modifying therapy, we have to think about uh, the fact that they may be on medication for several, several decades uh, and thinking about the long-term side effects of doing that uh, in somebody who's still undergoing neurologic development and undergoing immunological development as well. I also think about factors that might affect um, a child or an adolescent's compliance with the medication. So we know that teenagers uh, sometimes have this sense of immortality and a need to be independent, but also to have a need for their peers to accept them. Um, and so all of these can, can be very important into thinking about what the right medication for a patient is. And I also think about the role that they should play in de decision making. And while parents um, or other guardians may be legally in charge of medical decision making. Uh, it's very important to consider the, the child or the adolescent's role in participating in discussions about choosing medication.
So the list of medications that we use in MS continues to expand and uh, has expanded beyond even the list included here, uh, which is really exciting for our patients uh, to have so many options now that can be promising and really choose the right medication for each patient. So when I think about how I make this decision for my children and adolescents with pediatric onset MS, we traditionally think about first line agents being things such as interferon or glutiram or acetate. Uh, and sometimes as second line agents, but other times uh, when patients have more disease, more severity at disease onset, we think about natalizumab, uh, otherwise known as Tysabri. And we used to use a medication called cyclophosphamide, but this has sort of fallen a little bit out of favor with newer medications that have come out with better safety data. Uh, we may also think about oral agents, including dimethyl fumarate uh, and fingolimod, which uh, I'd like to point out is the, actually the only medication that we use with FDA approval in children and adolescents. Uh, and then where in adults, we might think about a medication called teraflunamide. Uh, there's uh, mounting evidence about its effects on fertility. And so in general, we've stayed away from this medication for the pediatric population. Uh, more traditionally, we had used a medication called rituximab, which had worked well uh, for some of our children uh, and adolescents with pediatric onset MS. Um, and now we're starting to use more of the ocrelizumab, which also has FDA approval now in adults with uh, MS. And then, of course, vitamin D uh, is something that we supplement to, um, uh, given its sort of uncertainty uh, in its exact role in MS, but the fact that we know that it's involved uh, in some, to some capacity and particularly in other uh, immunologic diseases as well. And so now at this point, I'll turn it over to Jim to talk about uh, motor and cognitive outcomes uh, in pediatric onset MS. Great, thank you very much. Um, so that was a great, uh, great um, first uh, half of the presentation. And so I'm gonna take you to something that um, is on everyone's minds and it's a, it's a little bit scary uh, sometimes, is the idea that there are motor or physical and cognitive uh, consequences of multiple sclerosis for both kids and adults often. And oftentimes when people think about multiple sclerosis and function, uh, they think about physical function. So in particular, walking or using your arms or even, or even vision. And so the data has shown in the past that persons uh, who are diagnosed as kids, so pediatric onset MS, they actually um, are able to withstand a lesion burden, as, as Dr. Yoshimura mentioned earlier, uh, uh, an ex sort of a, a larger lesion volume, a larger number of lesions. But they're able to recover from that pretty well and show less physical disability early on. But in the long run, um, and, and you see this on the right side of the screen, in the long run, um, the age at which certain disability milestones are met, so for instance, some difficulty walking, tends to be a little younger for people who had a pediatric or childhood onset of MS versus an adult onset. And these kinds of slides <clears throat> can be a little scary because you look at the slide and it says, oh, the average uh, age of onset of sort of walking difficulty in, in uh, childhood onset is about you know, 35 years old. But the thing to remember is that these are all averages. So on average, that's, uh, that's the age that was shown in the sample that was analyzed. Another important thing to remember is that a lot of the data on physical disability is um, from an earlier era. So here we have 2007. This is a, a great study, but it was done, uh, as you just heard a few minutes ago, in 2007, which was when we only had traditional first-line agents. Uh, and now we have more uh, efficacious drugs and medications and options that can help to prevent physical disability. But as I'll talk about in a minute, there's a lot of things that, that um, you know, kids and adults can do to help lower their risk of physical disability um, in the context of disease. Another um, issue is a cognitive decline. So cognitive decline in multiple sclerosis is something that persons with MS have known about for a long time, but the field uh, only the last 25 years or so has really started to focus on issues of some difficulties with attention, some difficulties with memory, some difficulties um, finding the right word for things, um, that are present in people with MS. And most of the research has looked at MS in adults. Um, this study here that I'm presenting is uh, looking at the symbol digit modalities test, which is a really sensitive test of cognitive uh, changes in MS, um, looking at it in people who had MS diagnosed when they were 
a child. So you see that it's, it's uh, uh, called POMS here, so pediatric onset MS, versus people who were diagnosed as adults, so adult onset MS. And similar to what we just saw with the physical disability, on the right side, you see that actually, uh, it seems that persons who are diagnosed as kids are able to um, per, you know, withstand the disease for longer before having uh, cognitive decline in some ways, but they reach cognitive decline at an earlier age, which you see on the left side of the, on the, left side of the screen. Um, an important consideration here, though, again, is that there's a lot of variability and there's a lot of uh, ways to intervene potentially early on. Now, there's a really important thing about cognition, uh, especially um, compared, compared with physical function, is that cognition is, um, has a lot to do with who we, who we are as human beings. If someone asks you, who are you, right? You may think of your job. You may think of where you are in school. You may think of the relationships you have or the responsibilities that you have. And a lot of those functions rely on your cognition. Cognition is a sensitive topic. Um, so if someone starts to have difficulty with their cognition, the feeling of not being as sharp as that you used to be is scary and it it's, uh, makes people feel self-conscious. So in kids, this is especially true. So imagine you are 12 years old and you're in school and all of a sudden you start to have some even subtle attention or learning difficulties, which are common. Um, kids have to do way more than adults do in terms of new learning. If you think about what most adults do, if we think about our days as adults. Most of our days are spent kind of doing the same thing as we did yesterday, and it's pretty similar to what we're going to do tomorrow. And it's, well, a lot of it's based on things that we've learned years ago. And maybe we learn a thing or two every day. But kids, they have to go to school and they have to learn something new every single day. They have to learn something new about math in seventh grade or eighth grade. They have to read a new chapter every day. They're constantly having to learn new information. So even subtle difficulties with attention or memory can have real effects on academic achievement in school. And this is really critically important, not only because education is important, but because it really can affect self-esteem in kids and adolescents. So kids are trying to figure out who they are. They're trying to you know, figure out who they want to be. They're trying to really figure out who they are among their peers. And, the, and having the sense that they may not be as sharp as other people around them, they may be lagging behind in some way, um, can make them feel real low in anxiety and depression, which is, which is a bad outcome, and we want to try to avoid that. Now, as kids move on to high school, you know, here's a slide that I put together to try to convey the anxiety associated with the situation in any kid, never mind having uh, multiple sclerosis. Kids in high school have overlapping responsibilities. They have to learn complex math every day. They have to engage in sports sometimes after school or other extracurricular activities, while at the same time finishing their homework. Maybe they're doing a job after school. Maybe they're also having to, well, they probably are, also trying to engage in a social life, while also in the back of their mind, thinking about the SATs that are looming in a year or maybe next week. So this is a lot of stress. And any change in cognitive function just adds burden to this stress. So you imagine that in high school, if most of us were sort of functioning to our max capacity to get everything done. So it can be really stressful when even a slight change, we're not talking about a huge change, but even just a slight change in your cognition can make all of this more challenging. And what happens when, you, when you're a kid? What happens when you're an adolescent and all of a sudden you start to fail uh, in school? Or if you start to have more difficulties than you used to? that sort of becomes a part of you and you start to think of yourself differently. And then all of a sudden your expectations for yourself may uh, sort of decline. And you all of a sudden you're like changing expectations for yourself or not thinking you could succeed, succeed not thinking of yourself as a, as a smart person. And this is you know, not good for your future in terms of career and higher education, but it also doesn't feel very good either. So this is, we want to prevent these negative outcomes. And how do we do that? But we really have to provide supports to people, to kids and adolescents who have multiple sclerosis and are having some cognitive issues. So getting kids the help they need, adolescents the help they need in terms of uh, tutoring or extra help. Um, because sometimes the kids are able to learn just as well as everyone else. It just takes a little more effort. Uh, persons with MS often say, 
you know, I can do what I used to do. It just takes me more effort than it used to. I need more attention to get the same work done. It takes me longer to get the same work done. So getting some supports in, in terms of like tutoring, maybe you miss something in class, maybe you need some extra help in organizing. So a major issue is prioritizing. Say, okay, look, maybe you only have so many hours in the day. Let's sit down and figure out what's urgent, what's important. Let's plan for the future to make sure that we're actually have long-term goals in mind and work towards those. It's hard for anyone, even adults, to prioritize. So getting help in that regard is good for everyone, but it's especially good for adolescents who are trying to get through high school and plan their future. You can do it. Be really, you know, encouraging. You know, it, it, encouragement goes a, goes a long way and, and, you know, backing it up with some emotional support. Um, you know, it's not, it's not easy being an adolescent as it is, but being an adolescent who has some sort of uncertainties about the future, they're wondering, should I, should I try? I mean, it says here on this online website that I'm going to have issues. So why should I even try now? Encouraging people to be like, okay, well, we can get through this. There are supports that we can put in place to make sure that you can overcome even the small changes in cognition that may come early on. And then also counseling or therapy. Um, you know, we all know that adolescents want the support and love of their parents, but we also know that they sometimes need to talk to someone other than parents. So trying to destigmatize um, therapy, destigmatize de going to someone else for help and being okay with that. Sometimes that's hard for, for us parents because sometimes we think, oh, if I send, if I allow my child to go to psychotherapy, I know that they're going to go in there and say negative things about me behind my back. It's okay. They can do that. If they need to do that, that's okay. That's a place where they can really sort of come to grips with what they're going through as an adolescent and come to really sort of work on, um, you know, overcoming the challenges and the fears and the anxieties to put forth their best effort to get through high school and to succeed. So I think it's really important. You know, the thing about kids versus adults is that adults, they don't have the support system that kids have. You know, they don't have a guidance counselor in schools that they can go talk to. They don't have parents that can, you know, support them and give them extra help and send them for therapies and do these kinds of things. So it's, it's uh, sort of a great thing, but it's also a challenge for everyone around them to make sure that they provide the supports necessary. Now, one thing I want to mention about cognition, and these are data from, from uh, our work here at Mount Sinai, so a study that we're doing on persons with early MS. Now, these aren't kids, but they're young adults with MS. And what you see here is a typical slide that you might see in any journal. And so you see here that cognitive function is on the y-axis, and you see persons with early MS and healthy persons. And you see that there is a very significant difference in cognitive functioning such that it's lower in people with MS than healthy persons. And these are the kinds of things you see in journal articles, and they're really scary. But the important thing to remember is that there's a lot of variability. So look at this slide. These are the same data as on the left, only that red dotted line represents where healthy, the mean or the average of healthy controls. And you see there are a lot of people that are right there at the mean, and a lot of people that are above the mean. So oftentimes when you look at research articles or you read something online, they're always talking about the average person. Well, no person is the average person, right? So we're all somewhere around the mean, sometimes above, sometimes below. And the point is that not everyone is going to be, you know, half a standard deviation below the mean. There's a lot of variability. In a similar way, here's the correlation in this early MS sample of cognition with the amount of lesions in the brain, the overall volume of lesions. You see that it looks kind of scary, you know, as there are persons with greater lesion burden have worse cognition. But if we look at the actual data points, you see there's variability all over the place. There are many people who have a high lesion volume, but they're performing better than people with a low lesion volume. And this is really great because if everyone was on the line, everyone, if there was a one-to-one -one relationship between the amount of disease and the cognitive outcomes, then we would say there's no window of opportunity. But a slide like this is actually really hopeful. It tells us that having this lesion burden is not a foregone, it's not a foregone conclusion that cognitive deficits will follow. And what we have to do is everything that we can in our power to sort of mitigate or attenuate 
these negative effects of the disease on cognitive outcomes. And so there are a couple things that uh, Dr. Yash Kumar mentioned earlier, but I'll mention them again. One is obesity. Obesity is, um, it's in some ways, it may be an inflammatory disease in and of itself. Um, and it's, we know that it's a risk factor for MS in kids, but we also know that it's a risk factor for worse disease progression over time. So the slide, you're, you're, this just came out last year uh, in the journal Neurology showing that bi higher body mass index is associated with worse gray matter uh, atrophy over time in people with MS. So obesity is something that's modifiable. It's something that is not fun to modify lots of times, but it's something that requires a life change, not a fad diet, but a life change to incorporate better food, but also exercise into everyone's routine. Uh, this is a similar uh, study, um, all those ones cross-sectional, showing that in a large sample of persons with MS, waist circumference, or a measure of really uh, adiposity and, and sort of fat around your midsection. And um, this is, I'm, I'm okay to present the slide to all of you because in a webcam format, you can't see anything from here down. So I'm okay, I could talk about this and, and uh, sort of uh, be believable. Um, but higher waist circumference and sort of abdominal obesity or abdominal fat is associated with worse physical disability in persons with MS. And this is, this is in some ways scary because this is all scary in a lot of ways, but it's also a window of opportunity saying, hey, look, this is one variable that I can work to control. And although this MS disease may seem uh, sort of unpredictable and out of my control a lot of the time, I can grasp onto this one thing here, um, you know, health and overall uh, healthy weight um, and exercise that I can control. So that's something that, especially for, you know, adolescents who are looking for ways to control their own life, you can say, hey, look, maybe you don't tell them, maybe have someone else tell them so that they're not, you know, don't feel compelled to uh, rebel against you, but let them know, let's avail them of the, the, the um, information so that they can make this decision to uh, live a healthier lifestyle. Another huge variable is sleep. Now, this is a major issue, right, in adolescence, because unfortunately, our, our uh, sort of educational system is working against adolescents in having adolescents go to school early in the morning, which is totally against their biological clock, but we have to work within those constraints. We know that sleep restriction in mice, if you, if you deprive mice of sleep, that it actually leads to breakdown of the blood-brain barrier, which is what is what causes, or at least was one is an initial part of the process of lesion formation in multiple sclerosis. So it could be a relationship. Oh yeah, in humans, we still have to look, but there could be a direct relationship between lack of sleep and inflammation in the brain and worse disease. So we want to make sure that kids are getting the sleep they need, not restricting sleep. Oftentimes, um, maybe children, adolescents, and adults see well, let's, let's leave kids alone. Kids are probably smarter than us. But adolescents and adults, that, you know, we, we oftentimes think of sleep as a, as a sort of uh, money in the bank that we can withdraw from when we need extra time to do work. But what we're saying here is that it needs to be a priority for people with MS, for everyone, but for definitely for people with MS. The other thing is sleep is related to memory. It's not just related to memory because it may be related to worse disease. It's actually related to memory in that when you go to sleep at night, your brain is actually working to strengthen the memories that you form during the day. So you go to school and you learn things and you study for a test or you hear a lecture. Going to sleep at night is the time that we strengthen those memories to make sure they're more longer lasting, which of course is really important for education. And, speak, and the other aspect of it is that sleep also prepares your, your brain to learn the next day. It sort of resets and cleans house so that when you go to school the next day, you're better able to remember information. And it's no surprise that sleep loss is related to poor learning capacity and academic performance um, in children and adolescents. So sleep is hugely important. And a third sort of overarching variable that I'll talk about is mood. So lots of times, you know, we think about mood, there's a huge stigma associated with mood. People who feel down or depressed oftentimes see it as a sign of weakness. But we have to remember that your sadness or your depression or your anxiety is not somewhere in your soul in something that we would call your character. It's in your brain too. And we have to treat it that way. 
We have to treat it as a biological process. That's not something to feel guilty about, but it's something to address. Mood is going to potentially be related to worse disease uh, because stress can, can um, exacerbate disease, but it's also definitely related to cognition. So recent work um, and other work too, but recent good work in the large samples has shown that adults with MS anyway, who have anxiety and depression have worse cognition. And it could be because um, the um, anxiety and depression is kicking off uh, greater inflammation that's worse in disease. But it's also the case that mood affects the same areas of the brain that are responsible for memory. So it's important to treat mood and treat and take it seriously. Another piece is psychological resilience. Psychological resilience is related to mood, but it's sort of the sense that you can overcome things. And right here is showing you data from, from our work showing that people who, with MS, who say that they're able to overcome obstacles, that they're able to learn from experiences, even if they're failures, that they're able to laugh at themselves when they make mistakes, they actually have greater strength, like physical strength, right? So psychological strength and physical strength are related. And the idea is that um, it may be related to just this underlying drive that is needed to, you know, if you're sitting there at home and you have to decide, am I going to just forget about that paper that's due tomorrow or am I going to push through, right? These are all things that have to be fostered. So psychological resilience in terms of positive mood and treating depression and not stigmatizing depression and making sure that, you know, if you are depressed, if your adolescent is depressed, if your young adult is depressed, that they get the help that they need to work through that because it's gonna have direct uh, implications for their cognition. And we wanna break a cycle of mood leading to worse cognition, leading to worse moods so you have to intervene. Um, so that's, that's mostly what I have to say about three key factors that are modifiable that can help prevent uh, cognitive and perhaps physical disability, which are sleep, um, treating mood, and preventing obesity and having a healthy lifestyle. So I think we have a conclusion slide next. So I don't know if um, other people are joining me for this one, but um, oh, here we are. So did you want to take this? No, go ahead. Go ahead. So I, what you've heard already is that MS is increasingly diagnosed in children, and this has probably a lot to do with our better um, sort of ascertainment, our better diagnostic criteria, tools for diagnosing kids younger, which is in one way scary because you're diagnosing lots of kids, but in other ways it's a chance to intervene earlier. And one thing that one hopeful sign is that we have better uh, disease modifying therapies than we had before. Um, clinical and MRI features vary uh, from adults. Uh, disease tends to have more lesions early on. Treatment options for uh, kids with MS, children with MS are increasing, which is hopeful. We have to make sure that uh, the medications are only good if they take them. So it's important that they, um, they adhere. Uh, cognitive difficulties, even if they're subtle, can be seen early on. Um, if kids are complaining of cognitive issues, we need to take them seriously and provide them the help that they need. And further research is definitely needed. Further research is also needed, always needed. We're going to identify um, new risk factors that we can hopefully modify, evaluate new treatments, and find better ways of monitoring um, outcomes over time to um, you know, validate effective interventions. Great. Thank you so much, Anisha and Jim. I really appreciate all the information that you provided on this um, unique part of, um, of MS, the unique component. Um, I do have a lot of parents that are on the web the webinar tonight, and their question is, how do I um, do I need to test my children? What are the chances of them getting MS if I have MS? Yeah, so um, you know, I think the the take home message that I would say is that really the chances that a first degree relative of somebody with MS would go on to develop MS still is very low. So what we know is that people who have an autoimmune disease, whether it's MS or, or um, a disease affecting another part of the body, um, their family members are at higher risk for other autoimmune diseases, but it may not necessarily be MS. Um, it really could be um, a, an autoimmune disease that either affects a different part of the body or just a predisposition to autoimmunity that may have no clinical relevance whatsoever. Uh, I think my, guy, my advice um, when I see parents bring in their kids and say, well, does my kid have MS because I have MS? Um, it's still to say that we just need to watch kids um, as they grow and develop and, and uh, address any clinical symptoms that they develop, but not 
uh, do a whole lot of testing otherwise. And the reason for that is that with a lot of these autoimmune diseases, including MS and lupus and other things that we're starting to understand better, we don't have one definitive test to say you have MS or you don't. Uh, and it's still a sort of very clinical diagnosis where we take into account clinical symptoms um, in addition to the testing results. And so when someone does not have uh, clinical symptoms, then sort of by definition, they're not gonna meet the criteria and we're not gonna make a diagnosis of MS for them anyway. And I, and I think to, to sort of echo on to everything that Dr. Samowski talked about, I think that empowering children and adolescents to live their life and um, you know take charge of, of the, the challenges that they're already facing is more than enough. And so I try to save children and adolescents from sort of unnecessary worry and anxiety that they might develop something um, because mom has it or because dad has it. Great, thank you. One of our parents asked, what exactly is a relapse? What am I looking for? My daughter is nine and becoming very private and not communicating. So as I talked about, you know, the, the things that we think about as being common presentations are optic neuritis, transverse myelitis, um, and, and sort of focal neurologic deficits. So while, yes, things like fatigue and mood changes are very common in MS, again, the things to look out for would be the sort of sudden changes where a certain part of the brain is not working uh, as well as it used to. And so those are the things that I would look for. And again, the, the most common things that we see in children and adolescents are visual issues um, and problems from the spinal cord. So those would be the things to look out for. And again, parents like to ask questions. So one question I received is, are more children being diagnosed due to testing accuracy? Is is the issue the lack of playing outdoors in the sun? Is there too much screen time? iPads, internet, is there lack of exercise and diet? Any, uh, lots of lots of questions. Do you have any answers? So maybe I can start with this one and then Jim let you kind of jump in too. But I think probably all of the above are, are uh, contributing in some way. So, uh, you know, I think, I do think that, you know, even in my career as a neurologist, have just seen that education and exposure to us as physicians about what to look out for is better. And my hope is that part of the reason that the, the numbers are increasing is because we're making diagnoses faster. So people who, you know, 10, 20 years ago might have to wait, uh, you know, 10, 20 years to really have multiple relapses before they get a formal diagnosis. Uh, now we're able to do that faster. Um, but then I'll let Jim talk about how maybe some of the other changes are, are factoring in as well. I think that um, we're not going to be able to, to you know, search any one of those and say, yeah, definitely increasing risk of MS, except for sort of the end result of a lot of those things like obesity, right? The obesity is going to be the end result of not eating healthily, spending too much time sitting down, not being out, you know, playing, you know? Um, so I think that that on the one hand, we're not gonna, you know, we don't need research to tell us that every kid should be out playing, right? Out like in the sun, out having physical activity. So on the one hand, you know, we don't wanna, you know, sort of if someone develops MS, you don't wanna look back and sort of beat yourself up and say, you know, maybe I, I should have sent them outside to go play more. Maybe they should have watched one less YouTube video. But I will say f going forward, whether you have MS or your, your kid doesn't have MS, you know, being physically active is going to be helpful for everyone. So it's probably as a societal shift, we need to move in that way. Um, and I think maybe Pokemon Go tried to do that, but it, you know, it didn't last very long, both on your screen and moving around. But I think some people ended up in restricted areas looking for some sort of emoji or, or sorry, you know, Pokemon. But, um, but I think in general, I think that yes, um, I think that diagnostic criteria and sensitivity are, are probably the major reason, but I think that, um, overall health factors and uh, you know, obesity may be definitely contributing. Great. Um, how often should neuropsych evals be done on kids? Well, I think that for kids, um, for, for kids it's different than adults because for kids there are, I think that you should have one done early on um, and because there are real implications for education. Uh, in, in the educational system, you have real supports there. So if you say, hey, look, um, my you know, son or daughter, it says here my son or daughter has a little bit of difficulty with attention, there are things they can do in the classroom to increase their capacity to learn. Things that they can't do for adults. Like you can't often go to work and say, this test says that 
I need extra time, so please give me extra time. But when you're a kid, you know, if you have that, those data available, you need to use the data in a way that helps you succeed. So on the one hand, you know, people think about testing as a way to sort of like, you know, sort of uh, validate a concern that they have about their cognition. And I think in adults, that's definitely true. But for kids, it should be a vehicle to get them the services they need in terms of educational supports. So I think if you have a kid or adolescent with MS, I think it's important. Get them, get them evaluated early on, and then you can sort of let the educational system dictate what they need in order to get the services that they uh, require. Um, so, I think that that, so I think early is important so that you can document change. And, and the fact of the matter is, let's, let's be honest, you know, um, if you're documenting change early on, let's say you have someone diagnosed at age 11, and you're showing that you know the attention has gotten a little bit worse, you know, over the next you know four years or so. That kind of documented change can be helpful when you're saying, "Hey, look, I want extra time on my SATs, and now I have a documented uh, history of showing a disease-related change in cognition." That's going to help you uh, get the support you need, even on that testing. But um, so I think the important thing is using it as a vehicle for support, not necessarily just because you're interested. So I do have another question about um, how does the long-term MS of children compare to adult onset for people with relapsing MS? Do children get letter cases or the same level as adults? Um, the participant writes that I am one of those who had symptoms in childhood, and now I seem to have a lighter case than average. I'm still walking and talking into retirement years, even though I've had lots of things I've had to deal with every day. I can manage quite well, and I am seeing some answer to my question. Really, the question is, um, new children get letter cases or the same levels of it as adults? So I think we, we don't quite know the answer to that for, for a few reasons. One, uh, research in this field still really is relatively new in the last 10, 15 years. So uh, I think we'll have more data on that sort of in the future as we continue to follow uh, children who have been enrolled in our studies at this point. Um, also, as Jim sort of pointed out earlier, the, the treatments have changed significantly. And I, I am very hopeful that that's going to lead to better prognoses uh, in the future moving forward as we continue to get more and more therapies that are um, geared towards children. So there are a lot of clinical trials happening right now, very much focused on children and adolescents, um, understanding that children and adolescents aren't just little adults. And so that may really improve our treatment strategies as well. And then the final thing I will say is that, uh, as I mentioned, children uh, have ongoing brains um, and so often are getting this disease before the brain is fully developed, uh, which occurs in, in sort of the mid 20s or perhaps even later. But interestingly to me, the immune system is also continuing to develop. And so there's sort of this thought that perhaps in some ways it is almost protective to get these diseases earlier on because your immune system is still at a point where it can learn um, from some of the challenges that it's, um, that it's presented with and perhaps even sort of quote unquote fix some of these or at least improve uh, on some of these diseases earlier on as opposed to somebody who gets this disease in adulthood when the immune system is already fixed. So that, that the long-winded answer to say we really don't know the answer to that, um, but there's a lot of uh, focus being uh, applied to that, so I'm hopeful that We'll have more specific answers in the coming years. Great. Um, as you must know, a lot of parents face the issue of insurance. So a question that I received, are there challenges getting these therapies approved by insurance companies since they're not approved for children other than Galenia? So by treatment, you mean in terms of medication? Correct. Therapies? Okay. Um, so, you know, we, we have some difficulties now and then, I think. A lot of that is going to be very dependent on geography and also insurance companies. So it's not such a straightforward answer. Um, but I also think that, uh, you know, there we, we, we have those of us who see a lot of children and adolescents now sort of know the, the ins and outs of the systems and how to advocate for our patients and get what we think they need. Um, so, you know, some amount of that is the fact that because not that much is FDA approved, it's almost easier in a way to get medication approved because insurance companies recognize there, you know, there is no uh, sort of alternative right answer anyway. Um, and then I will say a lot of the pharmaceutical companies are really willing to work with us, um, and particularly when it comes to children and adolescents. So even today, I got notification that one of the pharmaceutical companies is 
providing free drug for one of my teenagers because insurance wouldn't approve it. And so um, I, I think it is a difficult process and it can be a lengthy process, but um, it is a process that uh, can, can be sort of navigated uh, by somebody who has experience in doing that. So what would you recommend to a parent? Uh, one of our participants writes that it seems like Mount Sinai has a great comprehensive care program. How can a parent get that type of care at a center that does not specialize in pediatric MS? Yeah, so, um, and, that, and that happens to us here in New York City too, where, uh, you know, we do see patients that come from areas where such a program doesn't exist. And, and my philosophy um, is really to work with the local neurologist. So I think that all kids and all patients with MS need to have uh, a provider that's sort of close by so that they can go to and call when something urgent arises. Um, and so my strategy has been to work with the local neurologist and maybe see uh, see, see the child or the adolescent with the family maybe once a year, and then for interim visits, work with the local neurologist who can sort of implement the plan and the recommendations um, on a more frequent basis. Great. Um, what resources are available in, in terms of uh, collateral, like a brochure or a handout to bridge the gap of updated information for the first line practitioners like pediatricians or ophthalmologists? Um, so in my experience, what I, I generally refer people to the National MS Society website, they do have some materials on their, uh, on their website that can be um, helpful and I think are specifically geared towards uh, children and adolescents. Um, but unfortunately, we don't have, uh, you know, anything sort of more uh, sort of substantial at this point, um, although I think there's a lot of talk to kind of working on that. And then, Jim, I don't know if you have any specific recommendations on uh, things that may just be more broadly helpful for cognition? I think that um, in general, it's you know, the modifiable lifestyle factors, but really I, I have to emphasize that, like I've said a couple times already, that people really make use of all the resources that are available in the school system, you know, because there are a lot of uh, resources. I mean, lots of times adults with MS are like, you know, they get a referral for physical therapy or for P4 occupational therapy or maybe some sort of uh, even speech therapy. And, you know, they can't find a provider that takes their insurance. It's really hard to find someone nearby. But kids have that in their school, right? So if you can, like, get hooked up with the school and, and, and get the help there, it's all provided as part of the uh, education. Sometimes it's hard because you have to fight for it. But I that if you're a kid with a reading day, um, you know, or ADHD, sometimes you have to fight the school systems more in order to get the services you need. But when you come in with a medical diagnosis, they're actually more likely to jump up and give you what you need. So you just have to go make, make sure you're asking for it. So we've had a lot of, um, a lot of questions about this, um, about children with MS, and it sounds like advocating for your child is a, um, a thing that parents need to do. So I think that is a great um, bit of advice to um, to give parents. What about for the children themselves? I, um, you know, as children get older, it's time for them to start speaking up. So how would you, um, what advice would you give to a, a teenager that's in high school that's, you know, finding that they're having trouble, you know, um, and where would you have them? I know that some of the school resources, but what, what kind of specific advice would you give to a teen that's it's to, when it's time for them to advocate for themselves? I think, uh, yeah, let's, uh, I wish you have something. I think that, um, I think that they, I mean, kids are gonna be very different, right? We know that, that the same message for one kid may not work for another. There are some kids where you can just sell them you know, you know what? You, you really have to be responsible for your your own uh, sort of um, outcomes here, and they'll like jump right to right, whereas another kid won't. So I think that it, it's really um, important that kids they want to be in charge of their life, right? But to help them feel like you know it really is um, that their work is not going to be in vain, right? That it's you know kids want to feel in charge, and they want to feel like they can impact their life. So getting, making sure you convey the message that there's not, like I mentioned before, a one-to-one -one relationship between disease and now things aren't going to go so well, but really 
telling them that they can take charge of it. Now, I really do think that it, it is hard for um, parents need to you know provide all the support they can. But I think sometimes it is really helpful for kids to speak with a provider on the outside to to discuss things that maybe they might even be embarrassed to talk to their parents about, you know? And when I say embarrassed, I don't necessarily mean embarrassed about talking about like um, sort of, uh, you know, issues related to sexual function. I'm talking about issues related to mood, right? Issues related to feeling subconscious around other people, you know? Um, everyone has a different relationship with their parents and some sometimes kids, even if they can come to their parent, just won't. So at least availing, availing them of that opportunity. You're not gonna take your kid, throw them in the car and bring them to the therapist and push them in a the chair and tell them to start talking, right? But at least if you can provide a framework where that's at least possible, that they can talk to someone else. It doesn't have to be a therapist. It can be a teacher at school or someone that they can say, hey, you know, uh, my daughter is having some difficulties. You know, maybe you can just watch out for her. And, you know, if she, Maybe just chat with her a little bit and maybe start forging a relationship. I think there is no magic, you know, uh, uh, you know, um, slogan or, or advice that you can give any kid. But I think the important thing is to um, help them realize that they're not broken, that uh, their negative outcome is not a foregone conclusion, that they're not stupid. Right? This is a big thing that kids will say. Adults say it. You know. Adult, they say they feel like they're dumb if they make more mistakes in class. And the real challenge there, and be really encouraging, right? And talk about your own problems with your kids. I don't mean like all your problems, but you know, you sort of relate to them and say, look, you know, there are things that are hard for me. I don't do everything perfectly, you know? And sort of like get on board to like talk about the trials and tribulations of, of life that you have, you know, so you can have that sort of give and take, you know? Um, Sometimes, you know, parents do need to appear more human, you know, sometimes too, in their, in their own error. Sometimes parents feel like they have to be perfect. And part of being perfect is that they don't make mistakes and that they need to be seen as the person who can be the sturdy, strong person who has the right answers. Sometimes it's really helpful to say you don't have the right answers, you know, because when kids are fighting against you because they are trying to be independent, they're fighting against the the impression of you as being all knowing and right all the time. So just be a little vulnerable and say, look, I don't have all the answers in this situation. Let's work together on this, you know? So I think keeping the lines of communication open, trying to find ways to encourage kids to be an agent in their own life and not feel that they're helpless with regard to the outcome, helping people feel that they're not stupid you know, because they'll say the word stupid. But even if they don't say it, they might be thinking it, you know. Um, help them feel that. You also, you, a really a dangerous thing that can creep in is tolerance for failure. So what can happen sometimes is um, sometimes a kid can, they're, they're a really good, you know, sort of a hardworking kid, and they do all their homework all the time, and partly because they want to succeed, partly because they want to make you happy, and partly because they're scared of what their teacher's gonna say if they don't finish it. And then one day they mess up and they don't hand in their homework. And it actually wasn't as bad as they thought it would be, right? So then they do, they do it again. And you know what, the world didn't end. And little by little, they can actually change their expectations for, their self, for themselves and develop a tolerance for failure. So that's something that has to be cut off too, you know? Sometimes it means setting the reset button if you see that happening and being like not in the sort of a, a sort of a Hillary Clinton Russia sort of way. There I went there, but in a, in a um, sort of like okay. So sometimes people have diets and they fail and you have to jump back on. This semester you you didn't do as well as you wanted. Let's restart. You know, uh, and that's the nice thing actually about um, there are lots of hard things about academics. Um, one hard thing is that you have to learn so much all the time. You always have to be on the ball, like we talked about. But another nice thing about academics is that when you have a new semester, you sort of restart, you know? So when you're an adult and you don't pay your bills, you can't say semester's over, let's restart, you know? Or you can't go to your boss and say, oh, you know, new semester, don't have to do anything I did last time. But thankfully in school and even in college, there's always opportunities to say, hey, look, you know, last semester didn't go as well as I thought, let's start fresh this semester. So have, trying to find opportunities for that. I'm talking too much, so sorry. Not at all, that was all great information. 
And it's just, uh, you know, good to really think about how to advocate for yourself. And I think that as parents, we all need to, to kind of give that message to our kids because it's a really important thing for them to learn as they um, go through the go through their, you know, growing up. Yeah, I will say, I will add another thing that, that we don't talk about, we don't hear about enough, but it is a, a major issue. And I don't know if anyone on the, your, the uh, asked this question. I'm gonna pose a question that I don't necessarily know the answer to, but uh, it's something that your kids are thinking about, which is who do they tell about their MS, right? Do they tell their friends or do they not tell their friends? What if they're in college? Do they tell someone on a first date that they have MS? Like, you know, this is this is something that they may not bring up to parents, but it's on their mind, you know? And so it's something that needs to be worked through on some level. And, and, and one thing that, you know, we've found really ex extremely important for adults is actually just support groups. Not support groups in the sense of like, oh, a group of people coming together and, and talking about how challenging their life is. It's actually a group of people coming together and understanding each other, right? Because, you know, kids want to be mysterious, but they also want to be understood. You know, it's sort of this paradox. They don't want anyone to really understand them, but deep down they want to be understood, right? So when it comes to MS, they know that their mother, their neurologist, their friends, no one can understand them really in the sense that they don't have the disease. But, you know, if there are venues whereby people with, you know, kids or adolescents with MS can meet other people with MS and just talk about things that no one else in the world can understand but them, it could be a good vehicle um, for them. Great. Um, I do have um, one last question before we conclude. Um, how old is the youngest patient um, been diagnosed? So, so that's a great question. And I think there's not um, necessarily, again, sort of great data to say how young this can go. In my personal experience, the youngest I've seen was just under two and a half years old. Um, so quite young, but certainly that that is very rare. And um, uh, you know, that, that um, uh, is definitely not what we sort of see in common practice. In common practice, I would say it really is 10 and above. Um, again, with, the, with us trying to understand how the immune system works, I think we're gonna get a lot more information on how early we need to worry about that. Um, my sense is that prior to the age of two years old, um, your immune system is so underdeveloped and so in the process of developing that really developing an autoimmune disease is, is actually quite biologically difficult. Um, so I, I, I would be very sort of um, suspect that, that it could happen younger than that. But even between the age of two and 10, it is so, so rare um, that again, we start to think about hormonal and other environmental factors that are playing in. Um, but to, to answer the question specifically, the youngest I've seen was, a, was just under two and a half. Wow. Thanks for that information. Um, I would like to revisit the um, question that we asked about resources. And we do have a representative of the National MS Society on the webinar tonight. And she wrote that the society does have publications for children diagnosed with MS in their families. And they're also working on a new video that will be available later this fall. Um, she encourages you to visit the pediatric page of the National MS website. So it sounds like there's some great resources there um, on this topic. And absolutely, thank you for that um, update. You know, I will say um, when I have patients come in asking, or parents coming in asking where they read that the National MS Society is really the, the first place that I tell them to go. And I, you know, warn them just to, you know, take everything they read on Facebook and all the other blogs, you know, with many, many grains of salt. But anything they read on the National MS Society website they can take is, you know, absolutely solid. Yeah, I'll add that with regard to looking online at different things and, and um, no one's ever, you never, no one ever publishes a study on everything that isn't wrong with MS, you know? <laughs> so it's like, you know, there's not, no, no first, uh, you know, front page article of these are the things that are perfectly fine. So because of that, all the data that's out there when you start searching MS is all negative. No one's publishing papers saying, this is just fine, this other thing. So you have to realize that when you look at um, the data out there on things that can go wrong, you're looking at, on average, the things that could go wrong without any evidence that being presented for the things that don't go wrong. So it can really be disheartening. It's important to be cognizant of it so that we can provide the resources and help, but it's also important that kids don't get, and adults and parents, don't get too worried by reading about uh, those kinds of negative outcomes. Great, I would like to thank you both for um, some really informative information on 
quite an under talked about topic. So thank you, thank you so much for um, really providing some um, some great information, and I think um, allowing our parents to ask some questions um, that are on their minds. So um, with that, I want to say thank you. Did you have have anything you wanted to conclude before we move on? No, well, thanks very much. Well, thank you for the opportunity. Great. Well, thanks for joining us this evening. And as we conclude, I would like to highlight some resources available. Um, from Can Do MS that you may find informative and helpful. On the Can Do MS website, kendo-ms.org, you'll find some archived webinars, e-news, library articles, and Can Do On Demand. You can also submit a question to the Ask the Can Do team, which will be answered by our team of MS experts. I would also like to highlight some resources available from the National MS Society. They have a, a variety of brochures and video segments that can be accessed on their website, nationalmssociety.org. And you can also contact an MS navigator at 1-800-FIGHT-MS. If you found this webinar to be valuable, please consider donating to the Can Do MS or the National MS Society. How can Can Do MS continue to provide educational programs at no cost? You can join the Kick MS Squad. Kick MS is our new peer-to-peer -peer fundraising platform, and it's super easy to get started. You can ask for donations instead of gifts, have a bake sale, or walk or run a 5K. Anything goes. Another great resource available is MS Path to Care, which is an initiative with content created by Can Do MS focusing on shared decision making and healthcare experiences, as well as overall health and wellness. Please visit the Path to Care website at www.mspathtocare.com. The next webinar presentation will be on Tuesday, September 10th at the same time, 8 p.m. Eastern, and it's on managing your moods. As always, you can register for the webinar and tell a learning series free of charge on the Can Do MS website. And um, for those participating live tonight, you will see a survey appear on your computer screen. Please take a moment to complete the survey and share your input. Your feedback helps us to continue and improve our webinar series. I wanna thank all of our participants out there for, for joining us this evening and giving us your time.